When it comes to who exactly signed petitions to recall Governor Gavin Newsom, here is what we know. Most of those signatures came from the farther, farthest reaches of Northern California. I'm Alex Cohen. Welcome to Inside the Issues, the program that brings you multiple perspectives on some of the most pressing issues of the day, like the possibility of a recall election. Though it may be folks in the most rural areas of California that are most likely to assign such petitions, note that the interest in this particular potential election does not end at our state borders. Joining me now to talk about why Republicans all across the country have been weighing in on this issue is former RNC Chair Michael Steele. Michael, it's great to have you back with us. Hey, Alice, good to see you. So uh, let's start off with this recall election. Uh, apparently, there was a quarter million dollar check that was cut by the RNC given to supporters of this recall election. What's in it for the party on a national level as, as you see it? Why are they sending this much money in our direction? Well, I think part of it is just try to, to make a play for, for California, uh, California voters. Uh, if you can't if you can't win an election directly, then you kind of go through the side door recall and maybe maybe they'll have a Republican candidate uh, that will step in and, and uh, fill that void if the governor is in fact recalled. Um, you know, so it's 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 just a hard politics play, uh, and and you know they'll put the money behind that. But what the frustration thing is what what the party has to understand is one you just can't you know you know nosedive into a state like California and and try to mix yourself into their political uh, scenarios um, two that the party on the ground has to still provide a reason for the California voters to support them anyway. Yeah. So even if you get lucky here, the chances of holding that seat um, when there is a, a, a special election for governor uh, or a general election for governor, that that problem still persists. So the reality is this is purely politics, um, unfortunate politics given the, the things that the state has to, to deal with and contend with, um, but politics nonetheless. Yeah, and it's not just money, it's also some of the big names within the GOP who've weighed in on this. I'm talking about folks like Newt Gingrich and Mike Huckabee. I want to kind of go back in time to the year 2003, because a lot of us probably don't remember what happened during that successful recall election of Gray Davis. But when then-President George Bush came here, he said, I'm not going to weigh in on this. I'm not going to get involved, because right. on the one hand, right, California would be a huge trophy for the GOP. but do you think that maybe there was some knowledge then by uh, by then President Bush that if I weigh in, this could actually potentially make matters worse? Are, are folks weighing in today maybe kind of stoking, you know, that fire of, hey, these are all the Trump people that are doing this and therefore maybe sinking the recall efforts? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And the, and the analysis there is a is, is a particular one. You have to be very smart about how you look at 2003 versus 2021. Uh, what uh, then President Bush decided was uh, the cost, the potential cost, should he get this wrong um, for a new administration coming in the door, uh, could be, you know, potentially uh, difficult with a, an election the following, a presidential election the following year in 2004. Um, so I, I think that there, that those realities um, were one that kind of, you know, slowed the, slowed the roll, if you will, of, of the administration. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that the, the governor at that time, Greg Davis, was very unpopular. Um, his numbers were in the low 30s uh, with the voters. So that recall effort had a lot of uh, energy behind it from, from people outside of the agitators, meaning those who wanted to, to push the recall. But the general population was not happy with what the governor had done, particularly around 
I believe it was Prop 8, uh, and the immigration issue really blew up in his face. That's not necessarily the case here. Um, the, at least some of the polling I've seen um, for uh, the current governor is high 40s. Um, and, and, you know, his, his position is a lot stronger than his predecessor was in a similar situation. That's number one. Number two, um, as Republicans know firsthand from their efforts in Wisconsin to protect the incumbent governor from a recall, uh, Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin at that time, who went through three recall efforts, um, it is very difficult to unseat uh, a, a governor um, when uh, the numbers just aren't there for his recall. Let's uh, fast forward in time, Mr. Steele, to the year 2024. I know for some people it's like I can't even think that far in advance, but President Biden was recently asked about it uh, during his press conference last week. Oh, come on. I don't even think about it. I, don't ha I have no idea. I have no idea whether there will be a Republican Party. Do you? He responded, I don't even know if there's going to be a Republican Party. <laughs> Michael Steele, I know because I listen to your podcast, you're kind of done with this debate of, oh, is there going to be a GOP? Of course, there's going to be a GOP. But you like to focus, right. and I do too, more on the kind of the, the tenets of the Republican Party, the, the deeply held beliefs. What do you see as the future of those beliefs? I, I don't know. I think that's up for grabs right now. It's going to take some some folks who have uh, a tether to that to that history to those tenants. Um, myself, um, you know, Miles Taylor and and um, and others out there who are kind of pulling the party, trying to pull the party back to its original moorings around individual rights and liberties, free market enterprise efforts, et cetera, um, and kind of moving off of those things that have uh, arguably created more uh, division uh, even among Republicans as opposed, you know, let alone the, the broader community of voters out there. So I don't know exactly how that's going to play itself out. We, the only thing you can really do is make the case. And I think as, as this thing becomes a little bit more clear going into the 22 cycle and certainly the 24 cycle, my hope is that you see more of those, those uh, voters stand up and push back. If not, what you'll see is they just leave the party. And we've seen that already beginning in January, after January 6th, just in three weeks uh, in one state, 30,000 people left the GOP. Michael Steele, when you have those conversations one-on-one -on -one behind the scenes with people who are not seeing the future of the party the same way you do, how's that going for you? It's a it's a tough conversation if they want to have it at all. Uh, a lot of times they don't want to have it because a lot of these folks know they sold their soul to the devil. Uh, they know, they know what they did. You know they know exactly um, the, the the side of the bed they woke up on, and and they have to reconcile that. I can't reconcile it for them. I can just continue to point it out, <laughs> which is what I try to do. Um, but at the end of the day, they have to come to their own understanding of how of the role they played. If you're a job. Josh Hawley or Ted Cruz, um, a, a Lindsey Graham, the role you played, not just in the destruction of a once proud party that has its flaws and had its problems, no doubt, um, but also the role you played in armed insurrection. Um, in, in fomenting that and giving license to it, embracing a, a QAnon conspiracy ideology, um, embracing uh, fine people on both sides, putting children in cages at the border, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to reconcile that. I, I can't. You have to, you know, look voters, either the constituents in your own district or state, and certainly around the country uh, if you're looking to, uh, as some of these folks have ambitions to be president one day, you're going to have to explain that. Um, and you're going to have to explain it in a way in which uh, when people stop laughing, they can then begin to take you seriously. Former RNC chair Michael Steele, always great speaking with you. Thank you so much.